expecting some challenges to the healthcare system. And I'm sure you all have heard of some. One of the main challenges is uninsured patients. And this is because they're more likely to not seek help when they're sick. Two, reducing healthcare costs while still trying to provide patients with high quality care. Also, new technologies and medications are a challenge because they result in a shorter length of stay and cause healthcare costs to increase, and we'll discuss that more in depth in just a few. Some more challenges are improving access and coverage for more individuals, encouraging healthy behaviors, and earlier hospital discharges because they result in more patients needing nursing homes or home care after they leave a facility. Another challenge is that the new Millennium Healthcare system is less service-oriented and more business-oriented due to cost-saving initiatives, and this causes tension between business and care. However, when you start your career as a nurse, you don't have to be a part of that problem. Just keep in mind that nursing is a discipline of care and compassion, so no matter what facility you work at, remember you're there to serve others. The values of nursing are rooted in helping people to regain, maintain, and improve their health, illness prevention, and find comfort and dignity. Now, the National Priorities Partnership is a group of 52 organizations from different healthcare disciplines that have merged together to work toward achieving better and affordable care, healthy communities, and healthy people. The group set the following national priorities. One is the priority to work with communities to promote wide use of best practices to enable healthy living and well-being. The second priority is to promote the best effective preventions, treatments, and intervention practices for leading causes of mortality, starting with cardiovascular disease. Three, to ensure person and family-centered care. The fourth priority they set is to make care safer. Five, a priority to promote effective communication and care coordination, and to make quality care affordable for people, families, employers, and governments. And the goal of these priorities is pretty much just to improve the overall health care and delivery system across the country. The Institute of Medicine calls for a health care delivery system that's safe, efficient, patient-centered, timely, effective, and equitable. They put forth a vision for a transformed health care delivery system. And according to the IOM, nurses need to be transformed by practicing the full extent of their education and training, improving their education and training, full partnership with physicians and other healthcare workers in redesigning the healthcare system, and improving data collection and information. All right, let's talk healthcare regulation and reform. Healthcare reform, for the most part, is a governmental policy that affects the healthcare and delivery system in a given place. Healthcare reform typically attempts to improve the quality of healthcare, provide healthcare to more citizens, and decrease the costs of healthcare. Now, as healthcare costs continue to rise at a rapid rate, regulatory approaches had to control healthcare spending. So the federal government, which paid for Medicare and Medicaid, created professional standards review organizations, also known as PSROs. These organizations were created to review the quality and quantity of hospital care, and review how much hospital care costs. UR committees reviewed hospital admissions and identified and eliminated the overuse of diagnostic and treatment services ordered by physicians caring for patients on Medicaid. Some other factors that influence payment for health care, the prospective payment system, diagnosis-related groups, and capitation. The prospective payment system, or PPS, is a payment mechanism for reimbursing hospitals for inpatient health care services in which there's already a set rate for treating a specific illness. The PPS then grouped inpatient hospital services for Medicare patients into diagnosis-related groups, or DRGs. DRGs are groups of patients classified to establish a mechanism for health care reimbursement based on their length of stay at a hospital. These groups are classified based on primary and secondary diagnoses, comorbidities, primary and secondary procedures, and age. Most healthcare providers now receive capitated payments. This means that providers receive a fixed amount per patient or enrollee of a healthcare plan. The aim of capitation is to build a payment plan for select diagnoses or surgical procedures at the lowest cost while still contributing the best standards of care. A lot of long-term healthcare settings use resource utilization groups, also known as RUGS. These groups serve as a method of classification for healthcare reimbursement. 
Profitability also contributes to healthcare regulation and reform. This is because healthcare settings try to manage costs so that the organizations remain profitable. For example, when patients are hospitalized for long periods of time, hospitals have to absorb the portion of the healthcare costs that aren't reimbursed. This causes hospitals to increase discharge activities, adding more pressure to ensure that patients are managed successfully and discharged as soon as possible. As a result, hospitals will increase discharge planning and hospital stays begin to shorten. Now, due to patients being discharged very quickly, home care agencies begin to provide advanced technological care, such as mechanical ventilation and intravenous feeding. Managed care plans are a type of health insurance in which a health care system or provider receives a predetermined capitated payment for each patient enrolled in the program. The managed care organization assumes financial risk while still improving the quality of care given to patients. The organization's focus of care varies from individual illness care to prevention, early intervention, and outpatient care. Systems of managed care focus on decreasing costs, increasing patient satisfaction, and improving the health or functional status of individuals. The infamous Never Events. The Never Events are a list of 29 events in healthcare that should never happen. This list is revised and defined by the National Quality Forum, also known as the NQF. The Never Events are organized into seven categories, surgical, product or device, patient protection, care management, radiological, critical, and environmental. If any of these medical errors occur, they have to be analyzed immediately after. And in a lot of states, it's a mandatory requirement to report any of these events if they occur. In 2007, Medicare ruled that they would no longer pay for any Medicare costs associated with these errors. And due to our current culture of patient safety, healthcare organizations are fighting to get the never events eliminated. And here are just some of the never events listed here on the right, so you can get a feel of what they are. Wrong site of surgery, wrong implant, foreign object retained after a procedure, wrong medication administration route, scalding of patients, falls from poorly restricted windows, or misplaced orogastric or nasogastric tubes. So these mistakes have serious consequences if they happen, but they are preventable. And again, there are 29 of them. So if you like to see the full list, you can definitely research it online. Major health care reform came in 2010 when the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was signed which you may know as Obamacare. The major goals of signing the Affordable Care Act law were to increase access to health care, lower health care costs, and improve the quality of health care. Some provisions of the Affordable Care Act include insurance industry reforms, increased funding for public programs, this includes Medicaid and children's health insurance. Another provision is improved coverage for children. This includes adult children up to the age of 26. Regardless of their student status, they are allowed to be covered under their parents' insurance. This law was passed in 2010, but today parts of it have been reshaped through legislative, regulatory, budgetary, and legal actions. What you're looking at now is the Health Services Pyramid, which was developed by the Core Functions Project. It acts as a model for improving health care for citizens, and the pyramid pretty much shows that population-based health care services are the foundation for preventive health care services. And the way the pyramid works is achievements in the lower tiers, such as population-based health care services and clinical preventive services, contribute to improving health care delivered by higher tiers, such as tertiary and secondary care. Health care in the U.S. is moving toward practices that manage health, versus managing illness. Because if we can manage the health of a population successfully, we can prevent individuals from becoming ill and requiring services from higher tiers of the pyramid. There has been an increased life expectancy for Americans in the past century due to improvements in sanitation, patient teaching, such as dietary habits or blood pressure control, and injury prevention programs such as child seat and helmet laws. Right now, the United States healthcare system has five levels of healthcare services, such as disease prevention, health promotion, primary, secondary, and tertiary care. In larger healthcare systems, you'll find integrated delivery networks, also known as IDNs. This network involves teamwork amongst healthcare providers to deliver continuing care to patients at a capitated cost. 
The major goal of an IDN is to provide patients with holistic care, which is caring for the patient as a whole, their mind, body, soul, and spirit. And the definition is kind of in the name, whole, holistic. Now, large healthcare systems seek accreditation and certification from this organization called the Joint Commission. Accreditation can be earned by hospitals, nursing homes, home care providers, or laboratories. For example, a hospital can be accredited for long-term care, acute care, psychiatric care, or rehabilitation, just to name a few. Certification is earned by programs or services that may be based within a healthcare organization. Like there is the disease-specific care certification program, and with this type of program, organizations can seek certification for any chronic disease or condition, such as asthma, cancer, depression, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, pneumonia, stroke, women's health, or wound care. The reasons healthcare organizations seek accreditation and certification is to demonstrate quality and safety when delivering care to patients. It also attracts more qualified staff, and because the Joint Commission will do evaluations to make sure healthcare standards are being met. Okay, let's talk more about the five levels of healthcare, starting with preventive and primary care. Primary health care focuses on improving health outcomes. This type of care requires healthcare professionals to collaborate and work together. The focus of primary care collaboration is to improve healthcare equity, make sure healthcare systems are patient centered, and to promote and protect health. Preventive health care, on the other hand, is more disease-oriented and more so focuses on lowering and controlling risk factors for disease through activities such as immunization, blood pressure and cancer screenings, mental health counseling, things like that. Uh, in primary or preventive health care settings, health promotion is always the main focus. Now, the purpose of health promotion programs are to lower the overall cost of health care. This is done by decreasing the incidence of disease, minimizing complications, and decreasing the need for more expensive resources. Some examples of health promotion programs can be anything from nutrition counseling, exercise, yoga, or meditation classes. In secondary and tertiary care, the main focus is to diagnose and treat patients. As we briefly mentioned earlier, ladies and gents, people who don't have any health insurance will wait longer before seeking treatment when they're sick. As a result, they get sicker and end up needing even more health care. This leads to secondary and tertiary care being the most costly. The health care settings that provide secondary and tertiary care are hospitals, intensive care units, psychiatric facilities, and rural hospitals. In addition to secondary and tertiary care, large hospitals offer services such as social services, respiratory therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. Even on a busy or stressful unit like an inpatient unit, both quality and patient satisfaction are still a priority. Patients expect to receive respectful treatment and courteous treatment just as you would if it was you or someone you loved in that patient's shoes. As a nurse, you have a major role in bringing respect and dignity to each patient you provide care for. And as I said before, guys, the quality of a hospital can be considered poor if a patient's needs aren't met. So when you become a nurse, it's important to learn a patient's needs and expectations. Learning their needs will also help you to form an effective nurse-patient relationship, which can be therapeutic to the patient. And due to managed care, the number of days a patient can be hospitalized is limited based on their diagnosis-related group. So you'll have to use as many resources as you can to help your patient successfully recover and return home. And this is another reason why the role of the nurse is so important, because the care you provide to your patient impacts them long after they leave the healthcare facility. A lot of hospitals have been redesigned to make more services available on nursing units. Not only does this limit health care costs, but it also reduces the need to transfer and transport patients back and forth across different treatment areas. The focus of hospitals is to provide the highest quality of care possible so patients are discharged early but safely. Now, discharge planning always begins the moment a patient is admitted into a health care facility. When you become a nurse, you're going to have to discharge patients that need continuing care. Discharge planning should be centralized, coordinated, and interdisciplinary to make sure that the patient has a plan for continuing care after they leave the healthcare setting. 
And by interdisciplinary, this means collaborating with other healthcare providers and working together as a team to meet the patient's needs. For example, if a diabetic patient visits a diabetes management center, they're going to require the group effort of a diabetes nurse educator, a dietitian, and a physician. And I'm just going to go over some tips on how to effectively discharge a patient, just briefly because you'll learn about this more detailed in a later chapter. So effective discharge planning is all about educating patients and their family members on what to do when they get home and how and what to observe for when problems develop. Before you discharge a patient, you should make sure they have access to available and appropriate community resources, instructions for safe and effective administration of medication, instructions for safe and proper use of medical equipment, rehabilitation techniques to support their functional independence, instructions in potential food drug interactions, and counseling on nutrition and modified diets. Make sure you explain to the patient and their family what their responsibilities are and the patient's ongoing health care needs. And make sure they have the knowledge and the skills to carry out those responsibilities. Um, when and how to obtain further treatment and when to notify their health care provider for changes in function or if they discover any new symptoms. Oh, and by the way, you always want to make sure you receive written or verbal permission from a patient to include their family members in their plan of care because some patients would rather not have their family included in their plan of care at all. But again, you'll learn more about this in a later chapter. I wouldn't worry about it too much right now, but just a heads up. The referral process is a very important step in patient discharging, especially if you're planning specific therapies. Make sure that you provide the healthcare provider to whom you're making the referral to with as much information about the patient and their condition as possible. This ensures that no interventions are duplicated and no important information is left out. Involve the patient and their family in the referral process. You want to make sure you explain to the family and the patient the service the referral will provide and the reason for the referral. You also want to find out what the healthcare provider receiving the referral recommends for the patient's care and include this in the treatment plan as soon as possible. The intensive care unit, also known as the critical care unit or ICU, is a hospital unit in which patients receive close monitoring and intensive medical care. You'll find a lot of advanced technology on this unit such as computerized cardiac monitors or mechanical ventilators, for example. Patients on critical care units are usually monitored on multiple devices. Nurses on these units usually care for one or two patients at a time. And it's the most expensive healthcare delivery site because of all the treatments and procedures the ICU requires. Patients who suffer from emotional and behavioral problems, such as depression, violent behavior, or eating disorders, for example, they require special counseling and treatment from psychiatric facilities. Patients enter these facilities either voluntarily or involuntarily. These facilities can be located in hospitals, independent outpatient clinics, or private mental health hospitals. Now, there are some psychiatric facilities that offer inpatient and outpatient services, but it all just depends on the seriousness of the person's problem. Treatment in psychiatric settings are interdisciplinary. Nurses, doctors, social workers, and activity therapists work together to develop a plan of care that will allow patients to return back to a functional state. When being discharged from an inpatient psychiatric facility, patients usually receive a referral for follow-up care at clinics or with counselors. And just for those who may not know the difference between inpatient and outpatient care, inpatient care is for patients who have conditions that require them to be admitted into a hospital, whereas outpatient care, also known as ambulatory care, is for patients who visit the hospital to be diagnosed and treated but don't need overnight care. And a lot of times, outpatient care can be provided outside of hospital settings. Access to health care in rural areas have been a serious problem, and most rural hospitals have experienced a severe shortage in primary health care providers. In 1989, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act directed the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to make a new healthcare organization called the Rural Primary Care Hospital. 
Then, in 1997, the Balanced Budget Act established critical access hospitals for rural communities. These hospitals provide 24-hour emergency care with no more than 25 inpatient beds. The care at these hospitals are short-term. Care is only provided for 96 hours or less to acutely ill or injured patients. Though these hospitals are small, they do have basic radiological services and laboratory services available for patients. Nurses who work in rural hospitals or clinics require skill in physical assessment, clinical decision making, and emergency care. And um, the patients here at these hospitals, they do get sent out to larger, better equipped facilities, but the healthcare providers just make sure that they're in a stabilized condition before they send them out. Okay, next is restorative care. Restorative care services are provided for patients recovering from an acute or chronic illness. It helps them to regain their maximal level of function, or in other words, restorative care services are provided to restore. Due to early discharging from hospitals, patients usually require some kind of restorative care. For example, a patient that just had surgery may require ongoing wound care and activity or exercise management just until they recover and can independently resume their normal functions of everyday living. Restorative care is interdisciplinary. Patients and family members should be involved in the patient's plan of care. When patients are involved in their plan of care, they're more likely to follow through with treatment plans. You have to make sure patients and their family members have a clear understanding about recovery goals, reasons for any physical limitations, purpose for therapies, and let them know if there are any potential risks for these therapies. Now let's hop into the different kinds of restorative care, starting with home health care. Home health care is another kind of restorative care. Home health care provides equipment and medically related services to patients and family members in their homes for health promotion, maintenance, education, illness prevention, diagnosis and treatment of disease, palliation, and rehabilitation. Home health care focuses on patient and family independence, even though the primary objectives of home health care are health promotion and education. A majority of patients receive home care just simply because they need nursing care. Home nursing care provides patients with vital sign monitoring, assessments, administration of enteral or parenteral nutrition, medication administration, IV therapy, blood therapy, wound care, and respiratory care. Rehabilitation services are for patients who experience some type of physical illness, mental illness, injury, or chemical addiction. The goal of rehabilitation is to restore individuals to their fullest potential physically, mentally, socially, vocationally, and economically. These services include physical, occupational, and speech therapy, and social services. And then there are specialized rehabilitation services, such as cardiovascular, neurological, musculoskeletal, pulmonary, and mental health programs. There are also drug rehabilitation centers that help patients become free from drug dependence. Now, these specialized rehabilitation services more so help patients and families to adapt to changes in lifestyle due to a disease and learn how to function within limitations of their disease. Rehabilitation services can take place in a special rehabilitation agency, an outpatient setting, or in that person's home. All right, let's discuss extended care facilities. Extended care facilities provide intermediate medical, nursing, or custodial care for patients recovering from an acute illness, a chronic illness, or a disability. Extended care facilities provide patients with around-the-clock nursing coverage. This kind of care is found in nursing homes or assisted livings. Intermediate care, or a skilled nursing facility, is an institution that provides rehabilitation services and other medical and nursing procedures. Intermediate care provides care for patients until they can return to their community or residential care location. These facilities offer skilled care from a licensed nursing staff. This type of care includes IV administration, wound care, long-term ventilator management, and physical rehabilitation. And unlike extended care, skilled nursing facilities don't require long-term care services. Continuing care is for people who are disabled, functionally dependent, or suffering from a terminal disease. This kind of care is offered in institutional settings such as nursing centers, including nursing homes and retirement communities. Continuing care is also available in assisted livings, respite care, adult daycares or senior centers, hospice, and home care. 
And the need for continuing care is at an all-time high in the U.S. because people are living longer and many of those with continuing health care needs have no immediate family members to take care of them. Also considering the fact that a lot of nursing homes and assisted livings used to be mainly consumed by older adults, but now a lot of young people are needing continuing care. So let's talk about the different kinds of continuing care settings, starting with nursing facilities. Nursing facilities provide around-the-clock intermediate and custodial care, such as nursing, rehabilitation, diet, social, recreational, and religious services. Residents here are of any age with a chronic or debilitating illness, but a majority are usually older adults. The focus of nursing facilities is to provide a planned, systematic, and interdisciplinary approach to nursing care so residents can maintain their highest level of function. Standards for these facilities are regulated by the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1987. Government regulations require staff to assess each resident and make care planning decisions. A resident's functional abilities, such as their ability to carry out everyday activities, their long-term physical well-being, and psychosocial well-being is a nursing facility's philosophy of care. Nursing staff have to complete the resident assessment instrument, and um, the resident assessment instrument is a tool used to assess residents in nursing facilities and other long-term care settings. The resident assessment instrument is composed of resident assessment protocols, utilization guidelines for each state, and something called the minimum data set. Now, the minimum data set is a form used to assess a resident's functional abilities. Resident assessment instruments are completed to not only learn resident needs, but to develop care plans for new residents that have just been admitted into the facility. Assisted livings offer long-term continuing care with the home-like environment. Here, a group of residents live together but share dining and social areas. The residents in these settings require some assistance with everyday living but are relatively independent. Assisted livings provide individuals with independence, security, and privacy all at once. Respite care is a type of continuing care that provides time off or relief to people that are taking care of someone that is disabled, ill, or frail. Respite care mainly takes place in the home, but is also offered in daycare settings and healthcare institutions that provide overnight care. With this type of care, a person comes to the home to care for the loved one while the family caregiver steps out. Okay, next of continuing care is adult daycares. Adult daycares provide different health and social services to patients who live alone or with family members. These centers are usually open five days a week during normal business hours. They allow family members to maintain their employment and lifestyles while still being able to care for their relatives. Daycares can be associated with a hospital or nursing home, and there are also adult daycares that exist independently. Now, nurses that work in daycare centers provide continuity between care delivered in the home and at the daycare center. All right, last of continuing care is hospice. Hospice is a system of family-centered care that allows patients to live with comfort, independence, and dignity while easing the pains of a terminal illness. The focus of hospice is palliative care, not curative care, meaning its focus is to relieve the patient's pain without trying to cure their actual condition. Hospice can take place in a patient's home, a hospice home, or an inpatient hospice unit. Hospice care is interdisciplinary, and a lot of hospice programs provide respite care to help maintain the health of the patient's primary caregiver and the patient's family members. A lack of coordinated care and coordinated services is a problem that a lot of patients face today because the healthcare delivery system is so complex. Healthcare reform has encouraged two models to be developed that are used to coordinate care for patients. These models are called the accountable care organizations and the patient-centered medical home model. So let's discuss the two. Accountable care organizations, or ACOs, are groups of healthcare providers who come together voluntarily to give coordinated and high-quality care to their Medicare patients. An ACO aims to make sure that the patients are given the right care at the right time without duplicating any services or making any medical mistakes. The patient-centered medical home is the second model created to improve care coordination. 
The goal of this model is to provide efficient, effective, continuous, comprehensive, patient-centered, and coordinated care to patients. The patient-centered medical home model coordinates care, gathers clinical data, and monitors patient outcomes. This model uses teamwork, technology, and communication with patients to make sure care is culturally centered and accessible. Let's talk about some issues and challenges in the healthcare delivery system, starting with the nursing shortage. As we discussed before in Chapter 1, the profession of nursing is always growing, advancing, and evolving. New roles are always being needed, which results in the need for more nurses. And as the baby boomer generation gets older, the nursing shortage is expected to increase. So whenever you feel like giving up, remember that the healthcare system needs you. It's predicted that by 2022, there's going to be 1.5 million job openings for nurses. Another contributing factor to the nursing shortage is the slow growth in nursing school enrollments, often because of limited space, clinical site availability, and nursing faculty shortages. Now, competency is another healthcare challenge. The Institute of Medicine identified five interrelated competencies that are critical for every healthcare professional in the 21st century. They're actually listed here on the right, and they are to provide patient centered care, work in interdisciplinary teams, use evidence based practice, apply quality improvement, and use informatics. Every healthcare consumer expects that the standards of nursing care and practice in any healthcare setting are safe, appropriate, and effective. Healthcare organizations set policies, evidence based protocols, and practice standards to guarantee quality care is distributed to all patients. Competency, of course, is the responsibility of every healthcare worker. And as a nurse, you'll be responsible for knowing and following the standards established at the healthcare setting you work in and following the code of ethics. Lastly, quality and safety in healthcare is another challenge. Now, we know that nursing plays a huge role in quality and safety of healthcare. According to the Institute of Medicine, the definition of quality healthcare is the degree to which healthcare services for people and populations increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes while still being consistent with current professional knowledge. Quality measurement in healthcare is the process of using data to evaluate the performance of health plans and healthcare providers. Safety is an important part of quality healthcare. Healthcare providers determine the quality of their services by measuring healthcare outcomes that show a patient's progress. And some examples of measured outcomes are how well a patient functions after being discharged from a healthcare setting or the amount of patients that acquire an infection after surgery. When you become a nurse, you'll play a major role in gathering and analyzing quality outcome data. The National Quality Forum, also known as the NQF, endorsed performance measures to improve healthcare, ensure accountability, and to make sure that healthcare is safer. Examples of NQF practices include hand hygiene, teamwork, training, influenza prevention, catheter-associated UTI prevention, central line-associated bloodstream infection prevention, reconciliation of medication, pressure ulcer prevention, and fall prevention. Pay-for performance programs also help to promote quality care, effective care, and safe patient care. These programs financially reward healthcare organizations for excellent performance. So in other words, pay-for performance programs literally pay healthcare settings for their performance. These programs are a tactic used to motivate change and achieve improvement. Healthcare plans measure quality using the Healthcare Effectiveness Data and Information Set, also known as HEDIS. HEDIS was created by the National Committee for Quality Assurance to collect different kinds of data to measure the quality of care provided by different healthcare plans. It's actually the database of choice for Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. The Joint Commission, which is the healthcare organization that accredits and certifies healthcare programs, they require healthcare organizations to determine how well an organization meets patients' needs and expectations for accreditation purposes. When you become a nurse, you'll play a huge role in helping hospitals meet the measures for quality, efficiency, and patient satisfaction. And a lot of times you're going to be the healthcare provider who makes sure performance measures are fulfilled. Patient satisfaction is an outcome measured in every healthcare organization. The Hospital Consumer of Assessment and Healthcare Providers and Systems, also known as HCAPS, is a survey created to measure how patients perceive their hospital experience. The survey was created by the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. 
The HCAP survey is a way for hospitals to gather and report data publicly for comparison purposes. Patient and family-centered healthcare is an approach to healthcare that allows you to build relationships with your patients and their family members. This leads to better outcomes and greater patient and family satisfaction. Patient-centered care concepts include respect and dignity, sharing of information, participation in care and care decisions, and collaboration. Learning a patient's expectations early in regards to comfort, information, and availability of family and friends will allow you to better plan care for your patient. And try to ask your patient what their expectations are when they first enter the healthcare setting while care is being distributed and when your patient is being discharged. Enhancing relationships through nursing actions such as explaining care, being caring and compassionate, involving patients in care, and providing timely care improves patient and family satisfaction. The Magnet Recognition Program was developed by the American Nurses Credentialing Center to acknowledge healthcare organizations that reach excellence in nursing. Healthcare organizations that apply for Magnet status have to demonstrate quality patient care, nursing excellence, and innovations in professional practice. The magnet model has five components. Those five components are one, transformational leadership, two, structural empowerment, three, exemplary professional practice, four, current knowledge, innovations, and improvements, and five, empirical quality outcomes. And if for any reason you need to know more about the magnet model and the forces of magnetism, just let me know in the comments and I'll um, do a more detailed video on it. Now, if a nurse works at a healthcare facility that has magnet status, they are required to gather data about specific nursing sensitive quality outcomes and compare their outcomes to other areas of the country. So we're going to go over nursing sensitive quality outcomes and discuss what they are. Nursing sensitive outcomes, also called nursing sensitive indicators, are elements of patient care that are directly affected by the practice of nursing. And according to the ANA, nursing sensitive outcomes should reflect three things, the structure, the process, and outcomes of nursing care. And these outcomes can be things such as changes in a patient's symptom experiences, functional status, psychological stress, safety, art and job satisfaction, total nursing hours per patient day, and costs. The ANA developed the National Database of Nursing Quality Indicators to measure and evaluate nursing sensitive outcomes in hopes of improving patient safety and the quality of care. The National Database of Nursing Quality Indicators provides a database for hospitals to compare their performance to nursing performance across the country. And the reason nurses use these nursing sensitive outcomes is to improve the workload for nurses, enhance patient safety, and to create sound policies related to the profession of nursing and healthcare. Nursing informatics and technological advancements have led to major changes in nursing and the field of medicine. It's even impacted how we communicate with each other within the healthcare system. According to registerednursing.org, nursing informatics is a field of nursing that merges nursing sciences, technology, and information sciences to sustain and develop medical data and systems to support nursing practice and improve patient care outcomes. Because technology is constantly evolving, healthcare consumers expect information to be delivered and reported accurately. And the technology itself is never the focus of nursing informatics. The focus of nursing informatics is organizing, analyzing, and spreading information. Equipment such as IV infusion devices and computerized medication dispensing systems are just a few examples of technology that has changed the field of nursing and the overall healthcare system. Now remember that technology does not replace your critical eye and clinical judgment. Challenges can emerge for nurses when technologies are incompetent or need to be fixed and repaired. As a nurse, you'll collect data to measure outcomes and deliver safe patient care. Data are separately distinct pieces of reality, such as a patient's blood pressure, their respiratory rate, or a wound measurement. Collecting accurate data about your patient ensures that you make the best decisions concerning their health. Now, telemedicine, also known as telehealth, uses technology to improve patient outcomes. 
Telehealth has allowed nurses to be able to provide care from faraway locations by using video teleconferencing and electric medical records. It's also been found to be effective in promoting self-care in patients with heart failure and in improving the survival rate in patients in critical care units. Managing communication, information, and data is challenging in healthcare, but when you become a nurse, you'll play a big role in evaluating and implementing new technological advances. You'll use technology and informatics to improve the effectiveness of nursing care, enhance safety, and improve patient outcomes. And most importantly, you must remember that the focus of nursing care is always the patient, not the machine. So make sure you constantly attend to your patients, connect with them, build nurse-client relationships, and make sure that your patient's dignity and rights are protected. Globalization is the growing connectedness of the world's economy, culture, and technology. Vulnerable populations are a group of individuals who are more likely to have health problems due to excess risks, limited access to healthcare services, or being dependent on others for care. There are many problems that affect the health status of people globally, with poverty being the most deadly. Countries and communities that experience poverty have restricted access to vaccines, clean water, and standard medical care. As a nurse, you should always be prepared for future healthcare challenges and be prepared to develop solutions to these challenges before someone outside of our profession does it. The International Council of Nurses, also known as the ICN, is based in Switzerland but works to represent nursing around the world. Their mission includes the global representation of nursing, advancing professions, and influencing health policy around the world. Their goal includes bringing nursing together, advancing nursing practice, and influencing global health policies. The ICN works to accomplish their mission and goal by enhancing the health of all individuals, populations, and societies. Okay, let's talk quality and performance improvement. Quality improvement is the framework used to systematically improve the processes of providing healthcare services to meet the needs of patients. There are aspects about these processes that can be measured, analyzed, improved, and controlled. Performance improvement is when an organization analyzes and evaluates their performance and use those results to develop focused improvement strategies. Performance improvement activities are usually clinical projects that are made in response to specific clinical problems. They're designed to use research findings to improve clinical practice. Now, quality data are the improvement of both quality improvement and performance improvement strategies. Things such as fall rates, the occurrence of medication errors, incidence of pressure ulcers, and infection rates in patients are all examples of quality data. Okay, let's discuss quality improvement programs. A thoroughly organized quality improvement program focuses on improving health-related processes that contribute to patient, staff, or system outcomes. It's critical for all healthcare members to understand their responsibility toward improving the quality of healthcare. And we say all because there are many of individuals that are involved in just one process of care. Let's take medication delivery, for example. Though it's one process, it requires the role of multiple individuals. Medication is prepared and distributed by the nurse. Then there's the healthcare provider who prescribes the medication. Then there's the pharmacist who prepares the dosage the secretary who communicates new orders, and the transporter who delivers the medication. So, yeah, quality improvement activities should always be collaborative. So I'm just going to briefly explain how the quality improvement process works so we can discuss the models used for quality and performance improvement and then wrap up the lecture. The quality improvement process always starts at staff level. This means problems are identified first by the staff. Unit quality improvement committees review services that they consider to be most important in providing quality care to patients. Once a committee determines the problem, it applies a model for examining and resolving quality and performance concerns. There are a lot of models that these committees use, with the Patient Self-Determination Act model being one of them. The Patient Self-Determination Act cycle is also known as the PDSA cycle, each acronym in the model reveals a step in improving the quality of care. The P in PDSA stands for plan. This calls for the committee to review available data to understand current practice conditions or problems to identify the need for change. 
D for do. This step requires the committee to pick an intervention on the basis of the data that has been reviewed and then implement change. The S in the PDSA model stands for study. This requires the committee to study the results of the change. And A for act. This means if the change is successful and has positive outcomes, those practices must be acted upon by integrating them into daily unit performance. Now, the Six Sigma or Lean is another quality improvement model used by organizations to carefully evaluate processes to reduce costs, enhance quality, and improve teamwork while using the talents of existing employees. The Rapid Cycle Improvement or Rapid Improvement Event, also known as the IRE model, is used when there is a serious problem that greatly affects patient safety and needs to be resolved quickly. These events are very intense events that usually last about a week, which is why they're called rapid improvement models because improvements literally have to be made rapidly. The effects of these changes are measured quickly, results are evaluated, and then the committee will make further changes if needed. And lastly, the future of healthcare. As I said before, ladies and gents, things are always changing and evolving in healthcare, and especially in the nursing profession. But change opens the door for improvement. The greatest issue in delivering healthcare is ensuring the health and well being of all individuals. The healthcare system of the future makes quality care accessible to everyone, focuses on wellness, disease prevention across lifespan, and improves health outcomes. Healthcare delivery systems have to address the needs of the uninsured and the undeserved, but healthcare organizations are trying to become more prepared to deal with healthcare challenges by changing how they provide their services, reducing unnecessary costs, improving access to care, and trying to provide high quality patient care. The nursing profession has an important role in the future of healthcare, and of course, to those who are watching this video, you're the future of healthcare. All of the solutions we need to improve the quality of healthcare depend mainly on the active participation of nurses.